This is the second in a series of two videos about stoichiometry of gas mixtures. In the last video, we talked about how to insert density and molar mass into the ideal gas law. And in this video, we'll talk about partial pressures and stoichiometry. So in all of the previous discussions of gases, we have just talked about one pure gas in a balloon, in some sort of a container. But realistically, we don't come upon that very often. Most of the gases we interact with are a mixture of multiple kinds of gases, at least two gases mixed together. And so there's an additional rule we need to be aware of so that we can properly calculate information about each of these different gases. So we're going to use Dalton's law. And Dalton's law says, the total pressure of any gas mixture is equal to the sum of each of the parts as if it were alone in the container. So the total pressure of the mixture is equal to the partial pressure of A if it was alone in that volume, plus the partial pressure of B if it were alone in that volume, plus any others if there was more than two in the mixture. So this is the partial pressure of A. And so we've been using the ideal gas law in the past. And what we can do is we can specify for each of the variables in the formula whether we're talking about the total mixture or an individual part of the mixture. So here's what that looks like. So if we're doing a total, we can say total pressure times volume equals total number of moles times R times T, saying we're looking at everything in the container. Or we can pick one of the pieces. We can say the partial pressure, or piece A, times the volume equals the number of moles of A times R times T. And so in both of these circumstances, the volume of the container is assumed to be the same because gases take the shape of their container. So fewer moles of gas would still be able to fill the same volume of space. So same volume, same R because it's a constant, and same temperature. So if we isolate those variables that are going to be the same, we make those into a big lock that's a constant. So we can isolate RT over V, and then we can move P and N to the other side. So total pressure over total number of moles for this one. And it's also equal to partial pressure of A over partial moles of N, uh, partial moles of A on this side. So those are equal to the same thing. And so now, since they're both equal to this, we can work with just these two parts together. So let's rearrange them so that all the same letters are on the same side, because I think it looks better that way. So we'll do a cross multiply and rearrange so that we have the pressure of A over the total pressure equals the number of moles of A over the total number of moles. So. Notice that these are, these are ratios of the same thing, of the same component over the total for, for two different variables. So this particular ratio, the mole ratio, this is a special one. And this is one that has its own variable. So we represent that with this Greek letter chi, which looks like an X, basically. So chi A, that's the mole fraction of A. So that tells you how many moles out of all of the total moles are represented by that piece. And because this is a fraction, this is a ratio, it should be somewhere between 0 and 1. So if it was 0, there would be no moles of A in the container. And if it was 1, 100% 1 of the container would be that compound. So these are some of the trickiest problems in this chapter because you have to figure out which of the information you're given is about one particular piece 
and which of the information is about the entire container, about the total. So practice problems are gonna be your friend for this section. And I've left some for you to do. So you're gonna to need to determine when you're given a problem, if the information is about the entire mixture with all of the gases in it or just one part. So whole mixture or one part. So that's gonna be something that I focus on when I do this example problem is to try and interpret which of the variables are for everything or which of the variables are just for the part. So let's do this example that we have at the bottom. So the example says gas, gas mixture used for anesthesia contains 2.83 moles of oxygen, O2, and 8.41 moles of nitrous oxide, N2O. Total pressure is 192 kilopascals and we need to find the partial pressure for each component. So let's see, partial pressure for each component. So that's gonna be pressure of O2 and pressure of N2O. So those are for individual parts that we need to find. Up here, this is the number of moles for one part. This is the number of moles for just one part. And this is the total pressure for the entire mixture. Sometimes the problem will be nice and it will include the word total, so it'll be really obvious, and sometimes it won't. So sometimes you have to interpret it for yourself. So what we need to do to make use of Dalton's law that we found up here is we need to find the pressure ratios and the mole ratios. So we can start with whichever one is easiest. Based on the fact that the problem asked us to find the partial pressures, I'm guessing we don't have both of these numbers yet. So we'll start with the other one. We'll start with the mole fraction. So the mole fraction for oxygen is going to be the number of moles of just oxygen over the total moles. So we have moles of oxygen here, 2.83 moles. And we can get the total moles by adding the moles of oxygen and N2O together. As long as we know those are the only two components and we know all of the amounts, we are set. So the denominator 2.83 moles of oxygen plus 8.41 moles of N2O. Plug those in and we should get a number between 0 and 1, 0 0.252. So this is the mole fraction for oxygen and we need the mole fraction for both of them. So we'll do the same for N2O. So moles of N2O over moles of the total. And you can see I'm being meticulous and writing out the formula and showing all of my work, which is my favorite thing to see on student papers, at least the first time you did it. So the first time I did it, I showed all my units and all my labels. And now the second time I'm gonna show a little bit less work now that it's clear what I'm doing. Okay, so we should get 0.748 on this one. And what we know is the sum of all of the fractions should equal one, should equal 100% of the items in the flask. So if I add these two numbers together for a bullshit test, we should get one or 100%. If you're feeling really confident in your math ability, you could take the first number and then find the second number by taking one minus that number. But as someone who frequently makes mistakes, I usually prefer to calculate both of them the long way and double check that I didn't make any mistakes. So what we have now are two mole fractions. So we have this half, but what we want to find is partial pressure, the top of this half. So we'll set up our relationship for each of them so we can solve. So we need to find partial pressure of O2 over partial pressure of total, and that is going to equal mole fraction of oxygen. So then we can plug in what we know. We don't know the partial pressure of oxygen, but we do know the total pressure, 192 kilopascals. And the question didn't specify units, so I'm just gonna be lazy and leave it in whatever unit they gave it to me as. 
and the molar fraction was 0.252. We can solve for that, and we should get 48.4 kilopascals. All right, so far so good. So the same is true here. You can solve the long way for the other fraction, or you can use your knowledge that the total pressure minus one of the partial pressures will give the other one. I'll demonstrate it mostly for my own benefit. So partial pressure of nitrogen over the total 192 equals the N2O mole fraction 0 0.748. And we can solve that to get 143.6 kilopascals. And the benefit of working it out the long way is I can now do the bullshit test on my two numbers. If I add together all of the partial pressures, I should end up with 192 kilopascals the same as the total pressure that I started with. So that means my answers are viable and reasonable. Good work, that was a tricky one. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is how gases are collected in real life, because that's what you're actually going to be doing when you go out and you get a job doing chemistry. And so when we have a reaction and the reaction forms a gas, gases are difficult to collect. They don't sink to the bottom, they float up, up and away. So we have to find a way to capture them and to measure some properties of them. In particular, it's rather difficult to measure the pressure and the volume of a gas without some specialized equipment. So something that chemists have been doing is called capturing a gas over water. So volumes of evolved gas that are made by some reaction are often collected over water, is what this is called. So there's just a pipe shown in the picture that's passed through the water in a dish. So there's some sort of a pipe here, and here's the water level in this dish. Water, 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 all of this is water. Just pretend that water is green, but it'll work for now. And so there's water in this flask, and then there is also water inside of the flask up to a certain level. And so the gas from the reaction is piped in through a tube into the bottom of this upside down inverted flask and it bubbles up through the water to fill up that space inside of the flask. It displaces some of the water. But what we have to remember is that not the entire, uh, the gap is not entirely full of that gas. There's something else inside the gap at the top of the flask and that something else is water vapor. Some of the water as a liquid will evaporate as a gas and fill some of that space as well. So this is a mixture. The gas is a mixture of evolved gas and water vapor. But never fear, water is one of the most well-studied chemicals on this planet. So we happen to know quite a lot about water. So we have reference tables that can help us out here. So the total pressure, the total gas pressure of that gas in the headspace here is going to be the pressure of the evolved gas by itself, which we call the dry pressure, plus the pressure of the water vapor. And so this pressure comes from a barometer. This is something that you might see on the wall of the laboratory that you can use to measure the room pressure. So you take the room pressure and that should be the sum of the water vapor pressure and the pressure of your gas. And lucky for us, 
we happen to know quite a lot about water. And there are reference tables, reference tables that give you the partial pressure of water at a variety of temperatures. So all you have to do is look it up and then measure the pressure off of the wall. So here's an example one at STP, the vapor pressure of water is 4.6 torr. So there'll be more problems like this when we talk about solutions and inter intermolecular forces. So this is really a preview of that chapter. So be ready to see this again very soon. So the final piece to talk about is stoichiometry. So in your first chemistry course, you probably spent quite a lot of time talking about how to balance reactions and how to use them to make predictions about amount of product formed, amount of reactant used up, and theoretical yield. And so we can do the same thing for gases. So here's an example equation that's already balanced. And this is for all gases, nitrogen, hydrogen, and ammonia. And so the word stoichiometry is referring to these guys, these numbers in front of each of the compounds called stoichiometric coefficients. And these coefficients give us the ratios between each of the components that will be formed or used up. So let's do a quick 115 review here. This should look familiar. If we're given the number of moles of a particular component in that reaction, we can easily convert it to any of the other reactants or products. So let's say we wanna figure out if we had seven moles of nitrogen, how many moles of products we could produce. We can use the ratio of those stoichiometric numbers to find out. So we put the one we have on the bottom, the one we want on the top, And then we take the numbers here. So there's a one in front of the nitrogen and there's a two in front of the NH3. Make sure your reaction is balanced before you do this or your numbers will all magically be one. So we end up with 14 moles of ammonia formed from seven moles of nitrogen. So now through the magic of gas laws, we can do something very similar. So remember Amadeo Avogadro, that we talked about a couple of videos ago, who discovered the property and relationship of volume and number of moles. And he said, all oh, these two variables are proportional. If you increase volume by a certain amount, that means that you increase the number of moles by the same amount. And so now there's a bonus facet to go along with that that we can use here. So the bonus of Avogadro's law says, the same volume of different ideal gas gases will contain the same number of moles. I don't know if you realize how cool this is, but it's pretty cool. Let's keep in mind that this only this trick only works for ideal gases. So it only works when we're in ideal conditions, which we'll talk about in the next video. And it only works for gases. You can't hold this trick with a solid or with a liquid because their properties are not the same. So what this means is the sort of conversion that we would have used to figure out how many moles of one thing would produce how many moles of another thing, we can do the same sort of calculation using volumes because we know that the volumes and the moles are proportional. So let's say we're given a particular volume of nitrogen instead and that we wanted to find the volume of product that was formed, we can use the same trick with the stoichiometric coefficient ratios, but we can use it using the volume as long as we know that these are ideal gases. So we can say two liters of ammonia over one liter of nitrogen. And that'll give us 10 liters of ammonia formed.
So you will need to check and make sure that all of the components of the reaction are gases, or this doesn't apply here. And this works because we know that one mole of any gas will take up the same amount of space. So if we have one mole of nitrogen, it's going to be one third of the volume of hydrogen that's needed. So three balloons worth of hydrogen and one balloon balloon worth of N2. And that's the same amount of gas of two balloons of NH3. So the volume of this piece, of this balloon, of this balloon, and this balloon, the volume of each of these are the same, if they have the same number of moles. So that is a powerful magic trick that we are able to do here. And with that in mind, I would like to introduce one final variable here, the standard molar volume. So standard, as you might have guessed, indicates it's at standard temperature and pressure. So we're at STP, zero degrees Celsius, and one atmosphere. And so at this set of conditions, we can define the exact volume of one mole of gas. So at this set of conditions, one mole of any gas will equal 22.4 liters. So if I had this amount, I could skip straight from the volume to the number of moles without doing the ideal gas law. Save myself a little bit of math. So these are the tools that you need for mixtures of gases that have multiple pieces together. You can convert between them and you can calculate the partial pressures and mole fractions for each of them. In our next video, we will be talking about the kinetic molecular theory and identifying what assumptions we made in order to, for this math to work.